<laughs> thank you. Okay, everybody, welcome and thanks for coming. And again, thanks for those who've already turned on your cameras. Um, if you haven't yet turned on your camera, please do that now because it's much easier to give a talk to live human faces. Um, I'm the moderator for the session. I'm Victoria Kaplan and I work in the library as the head of information instruction and collection services. Tonight, we're really excited to host this iTalk with Mike Chinoy, where he's going to be sharing on his recent book, Are You With Me? Kevin Boyle and the Rise of the Human Rights Movement, which you can see right there on your screen. Mike will talk for around 30 minutes or so, and then we're going to have time for plenty of Q&A. Um, I also want to mention the library also has an e-copy available and a paper copy. Um, the paper copy is currently checked out. But if you want to buy your own signed copy, please contact Mike Chinoy directly. I stuck, um, I put his email into the chat and I'll do that again. It's Mike Chinoy at Gmail. Um, I'll also be emailing you after the talk with the contact information. Okay, now about the speaker. Um, Mike was a correspondent for CNN for 24 years from the 80s to the 2000s, and he's won a lot of important journalism awards. He's won the Emmy, the Peabody, the DuPont. I mean, it's really, I'm sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you, Mike, but it's impressive, okay? It's really <laughs> impressive. He's also served as CNN's first bureau chief in Beijing and in Hong Kong as a senior Asia correspondent. And while he's mainly been working in China and North Korea, he also reported on the troubles in Northern Ireland in the 70s and 80s. And that's when he met Kevin Boyle. Um, he's also currently a non-resident senior fellow at the University of Southern California's US China Institute, and he's based in Hong Kong. And we have um, two other books um, by him in our library collection, um, China Live, People, Power, and the Television Revolution, and Meltdown, the Inside Story of the North Korean um, Nuclear Crisis. So please, everyone, please join me in welcoming Mike Chinoy. Yay, thank you, Mike. Thanks very much, Tori. I appreciate the kind introduction and good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted that so many people have decided to take a little bit of time uh, to, to attend uh, this event. Um, I, I want to talk today about my book, uh, Kevin Boyle, and uh, are you with me? Kevin Boyle and the Rise of the Human Rights Movement. Um, although I'm sure none of you ever heard of this guy, um, Kevin Boyle was uh, a charismatic, larger than life figure whose life and work reflected and shaped the emergence of an international movement to defend and expand the protection of human rights. Formed in the battle for, battle for civil rights in Northern Ireland, he subsequently became an important figure on the wider international stage. However, many of his greatest achievements took place away from the glare of publicity and his compelling personal story is curiously unknown. So I wrote this book, Are You With Me? Kevin Boyle and the Rise of the Human Rights Movement to explore his life and legacy um, and I would argue his continued relevance at a time when human rights are increasingly under threat around the world. My own interest in Northern Ireland, which is how I met Boyle, uh, grew out of my involvement uh, as a college student in the US anti-Vietnam War and civil rights uh, movements. Uh, I found something compelling in the idea that there was a corner of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland of all places, where a minority, the Catholic population appeared to be treated as badly and in some ways even worse than blacks were being treated in the deep south of the United States. So I started reading up out of curiosity on the Northern Ireland civil rights movement. And then when, uh, for those of you who are currently uh, at, the, at the university, when I was roughly your age, I was a, a junior at Yale University. My parents who were academics spent a sabbatical year in London and I went to visit them over the Christmas holiday. And for a term paper for a course, I, I, I was gonna write something about the situation in Northern Ireland. So uh, I decided to go to Dublin uh, in the Irish Republic. I was too scared at that point to go to Northern Ireland. It looked too dangerous, but I went to Dublin to see if I could do some interviews. And I went to the offices of an organization called Sinn Féin, which was then uh, and is still now considered to be the political wing of the Irish Republican Army, which was fighting to unite the divided halves of Ireland. And a very friendly guy welcomed me in and, and he said, uh, 
I said, hi, I'd like to learn what's going on. And he said, uh, go in the other room, have a wee word with Joe in the typical Irish accent. So I opened the door and I discovered this man, Joe Cahill, who was a legendary IRA gunman who until uh, fleeing to Dublin from Belfast a few months before, had been the commander of the Belfast Brigade of the Irish Republican Army and was now the most wanted man in Northern Ireland. And he apparently had nothing better to do with his time than to spend a whole afternoon explaining his perspective on the conflict in Northern Ireland. It was absolutely fascinating. And I ended up writing uh, an article about the meeting uh, for the Yale Daily News. And uh, it's really my first journalistic scoop, as well as my first introduction to the complexities of the conflict in Northern Ireland. Then six months later, at the end of the school year, I went back to London to visit my parents again. And my father, who was a sociologist, had been invited to give a lecture at the Queen's University of Belfast. And that uh, is where I first met uh, Kevin Boyle. Uh, because I went along with my father on this trip uh, because I was very curious to see what, what it was like. And I discovered that Boyle, who was a law professor at the Queen's University of Belfast, was going to be a visiting scholar at Yale University for the 1972-73 academic year. And I convinced him to uh, supervise an independent reading course with me on topics in Irish history. And he assigned me books and articles and once a week we would meet over coffee and discuss all of this and we became friends and he also became something of an intellectual mentor as I uh, sought to understand events in Ireland. Uh, after graduation I started my journalistic career freelancing in Belfast in the mid-1970s and I would often stay in the spare room at Boyle's home near the campus of Queen's University and we remained in touch and in the 1980s, uh, when I moved to London as the fourth foreign correspondent hired by an upstart television news network called CNN, I continued to cover Northern Ireland. If you look closely at this photo, you can see there's a black circle here. This is a big in 1984. And here is a cameraman, here is the sound man, and this guy, which would then had only black hair as opposed to some gray like now is me. So I was in the middle of it, making lots and lots of trips to Northern Ireland uh, throughout my many years in London for CNN before I moved uh, to Beijing. Um, after Boyle's death from lung cancer in 2010 uh, at the tragically young age of 67, his wife Joan told me of the archive of all his papers uh, that had been donated to the National University, University of Ireland in Galway. And after I went and had a look, uh, I was so struck by how fascinating the material was that I decided to embark on this project. And it took nearly four years perusing thousands of documents and conducting over a hundred interviews to con construct a picture of a remarkable man and his time. My life has been uh, involved within Northern Ireland and the Republic, uh, and now on a much larger plane, on that simple assumption that uh, each human being, whatever their set of beliefs, is entitled by, by virtue of being a human being to basic human rights. My life Boyle used to like to use the term the three A's to describe himself, activist, advocate, and academic. The battle for civil rights in Northern Ireland is where he began to play all of these roles. He was, as I mentioned, a young law lecturer at the Queen's University in Belfast when he helped to found the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association. And he became arguably among the dozen most important figures in the Northern Ireland civil rights movement. Let me give you a bit of background for those of you, and I suspect it's most of you, who are not familiar with Northern Ireland and its complex and tortured history. When the rest of predominantly Catholic Ireland achieved independence from Britain, Ireland had been a British colony for centuries, when, uh, when Ireland achieved independence uh, in uh, 1921, Protestants in the North, who were descendants of the largely Scottish settlers who colonized Ireland on Britain's behalf, created a kind of statelet to ensure their continued domination. 
They called themselves unionists. They supported Northern Ireland's continuing union with the rest of the Uni United Kingdom. And more militant unionists were termed loyalists. The Catholics, who generally identified themselves as Irish, became known as nationalists. And more militant uh, nationalists were known as Republicans. Most Catholic slash nationalists saw Northern Ireland as an illegitimate state and supported a united Ireland in which the North would become part of the Irish Republic. What was so complicated here was that each community saw itself as a victim, a beleaguered minority under siege from the other side. That's because each community was in effect a minority. The Catholics were the minority in Northern Ireland where they made up about a third of the population and the Protestants were a minority on the entire island of Ireland. The Protestants ensured they maintained their position in Northern Ireland by systematically discriminating against Catholics in housing, jobs, political rights, and other areas. This included measures that banned Northern Catholics from even expressing an Irish sense of identity, for instance, by making it illegal to fly the Irish flag. The local police was turned into a tool for sustaining unionist rule. The main police force, the Royal Ulster Constabulary was 90% Protestant. There was something called the Special Powers Act passed in the 1920s. This allowed searches and arrests without warrant, internment without trial, and gave the government the power to ban meetings, books, publications, powers that didn't exist anywhere else in the United Kingdom. In terms of employment, many large firms, indeed whole industries, were entirely Protestant. I assume many of you have seen the movie Titanic. How many of you know that the Titanic was actually built in Belfast because it was a great center for shipbuilding back, back then? I'm something of a Titanic buff myself, so on my earliest visits to Northern Ireland, I made it a point to go take a look at where it was built, the Harland and Wolfe shipyards shipyard which was notorious for not hiring Catholics. By the way, if you ever go to Belfast, there is a fantastic Titanic museum at this site now. It's really, really well done if we can ever, COVID ever goes away and we can start to travel again. In any case, the troubles began as a peaceful protest movement demanding that the province's minority Catholic population be given the same civil and political rights that uh, the Protestant majority enjoyed, as well as other citizens of other British citizens enjoyed. Kevin Boyle was a driving force behind numerous, many early demonstrations and rallies. He can be seen here. This is Boyle with the goatee, uh, the, se the second to right. Next to him is a woman named Bernadette Devlin, who again, I'm sure none of you have heard of, but she became one of the most famous figures in the civil rights period in Northern Ireland and worked closely with Boyle. Uh, these early protests were not designed to force Northern Ireland um, into a united Ireland, although that had long been the goal of the Irish Republican Army and a militant Irish Republicans. Instead, the movement was inspired in large part by the civil rights movement in the United States and by the spirit of protest that swept the Western world during the I think one of the problems was that the absence, in the absence of a bill of rights or some other some other uh, statement of rights, the courts really, unlike the United States civil rights campaign, were not used at all. Um, uh, and so uh, it's pr it was predictable, I think, that demonstration uh, became part of um, uh, the, the claim for justice, um, as indeed demonstrations arose, as you know, in the United States in the great civil rights movement and marches in the southern United States led by Martin Luther King. And I think one of but the opposition to the civil rights demands was intense, especially among hardline Protestants like the Reverend Ian Paisley, a fundamentalist preacher who saw the civil rights movement as an IRA plot to take Northern Ireland out of the UK into a Catholic dominated Irish uh, United Ireland. At many early civil rights marches, Paisley and his extreme Protestant supporters organized counter demonstrations. They will not be able to jackboot the Protestants any longer into the ground. <laughs> 
Sensitive to the opposition of Paisley and other militant Protestants, Northern Ireland's Unionist-dominated government met the largely peaceful protests with repression. Boyle remained at the forefront of these confrontations. The Labour Committee, on your behalf, made a decision. That decision was that they would not accept any rewrite on this march. One of, the, one of the most controversial early episodes in which Boyle was involved uh, became known as the Long March, a march from Belfast to Northern Ireland's second major city, Derry, in January 1969. It was inspired by the Reverend Martin Luther King's famous march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama in 1965, which was a turning point in the U.S. civil rights movement. The goal of this Belfast to Derry march was to increase the pressure on Northern Ireland's unionist government to implement basic reforms, such as ending discrimination against Catholics in housing and employment and ensuring the right of all citizens to vote as a set of complex rules established by the unionist authorities had led to the widespread disenfranchisement. Boyle can be seen here, the third, uh, third row from, from the front, uh, on, walking on, on, on the left. At Berntollet, about 10 miles from Derry, the marchers were attacked by club-wielding Protestant loyalists, including off-duty policemen. It was a key moment in the radicalization of Northern Ireland's Catholic minority. Um, I think the students did not deliberately seek out uh, violent, a violent confrontation with the police in any context. In the case of the Derry March, which I must come to, because I think looking back, and there may be many people listening who, who, who would specifically blame me and others for, for what, what has developed, which I think is, it is wrong, but it's understandable, perhaps. But looking at that march, which I think was a bit of a watershed, um, the majority who went on that march, I do not believe, honestly anticipated what would happen. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, Boyle came to feel that staging the march was a mistake because it unleashed passions between the two communities that were just below the surface in Northern Ireland then, and thus became an important turning point in Northern Ireland's descent into the But yes, I do regret that demonstration because it brought out on the surface realities that perhaps we were, I mean, we were not aware of. I, I think each generation, each generation perhaps one, exa one exaggerates how much people knew. I certainly didn't know uh, or have had a feeling for the depths of antagonism uh, that existed and the sense of territory that existed in Northern Ireland. And I think that was true for quite a percentage of the young people on that parade. Um, yes, there may be, it may be that it was irresponsible in retrospect, but the motives at that time were not confrontationist uh, uh, at all. But, but as Boyle noted, the communal antagonism that the march inadvertently triggered ran very deep even though most of the youthful marchers had no intention of stirring up such, such passions and were naively unaware of the intensity of sectarian hatred. After riots in Belfast and Derry, in which Catholics fought the police and then Protestants fought Catholics and in Belfast burned Catholics out of their homes in mixed neighborhoods, the British army was deployed to restore order and keep the communities apart. Ironically, in view of what was to happen, the Catholics initially welcomed the British troops as knights in shining armor. Locals gave them pots of tea and sandwiches and saw them as protectors from Protestant mobs. But in the absence of broader reform, the British troops were still ultimately there to maintain the existing system, which was, as a unionist prime minister once described it, a quote, Protestant parliament for a Protestant state. And it was not long before Catholic opinion would turn against them. This led to the emergence of the Provisional IRA. Dormant for years, the Provisional IRA was revived initially as a defense force for Catholic areas under attack by Protestant mobs. But the IRA quickly switched to a campaign of violence and terrorism, in which British soldiers, along with some Protestants, were the primary targets. The IRA's goal was to force the British to leave and uh, to create a united Ireland. The violence got worse with constant riots, bombings, and shootings. 
In August of 1971, the Northern Ireland government introduced a policy of interning people without trial. Thousands of troops and police were dispatched to round up suspected members of the IRA. But nothing went according to plan. With the growth of the provisional IRA, police intelligence files weren't up to date, and many IRA men, suspecting that internment was imminent, had gone on the run, so the troops ended up arresting the wrong people, fathers, brothers, not the original targets, and almost everyone who was arrested was a Catholic. No Protestant loyalist extremists were targeted. At a detention center initially known as Long Cash and later the Maze, brutal methods of interrogation were used including denial of sleep and food, being forcing people to stand spread eagle like this with their arms out against a wall for long periods. But instead of calming things down, the move produced an eruption of violence in the streets with major gun battles between the army and the IRA. Kevin Boyle was appalled by internment as well as by the upsurge in violence, which he consistently opposed. But the government would not do to demands to end internment so looking to channel popular anger in a nonviolent direction and undermine support for the IRA, Boyle and the Civil Rights Association in Northern Ireland decided to hold a series of marches. The first held in Belfast on January 1st, 1971, passed off peacefully. Uh, at Boyle's suggestion, uh, it was agreed to hold the second in Derry and it became known as Bloody Sunday. It was a day when British troops opened fire and killed 14 unarmed demonstrators. Boyle's role as the person who suggested the march incidentally wasn't publicly known until I discovered it in my research. Bloody Sunday was a watershed. Support for the IRA in the Catholic community um, skyrocketed. Uh, the, uh, as uh, violence uh, accelerated, the British government dissolved the Protestant dominated Northern Ireland parliament, which was based here at a building uh, outside Belfast called, Belfast called Stormont and imposed direct rule from London. Protestant extremists responded by setting up their own paramilitary groups. Indeed, when I made my first visit to Northern Ireland a few months later, it turned out to be the weekend that the biggest of these groups, the Ulster Defense Association, decided to set up roadblocks to barricade Protestant areas because the Catholics were doing the same thing in their areas. Boyle, as I've indicated, was resolutely opposed to violence. Under any circumstances, uh, supported, uh, approved of uh, uh, violence in Northern Ireland. I have always been a believer that it is possible for the two communities to come to uh, a new relationship in equality. After Bloody Sunday, uh, Boyle concluded that the space for street politics that um, uh, had disappeared. And I, though I didn't know it then, this is what had prompted him to take a year away from Northern Ireland and to come to Yale to figure out his next step. What he decided to do was, to, uh, was to, to shift his focus to what he spent the rest of his life doing, which was using the law to advance the protection of human rights, initially in Northern Ireland and then beyond. Instead of supporting protests in the street, which so easily fueled this cycle of violence, he became the lawyer who brought the first individual cases of torture and mistreatment of Northern Irish detainees by the British authorities to the European Commission on Human Rights in Strasbourg, France. Back then, the European Commission and the European Court of Human Rights was in the very early stages of evolving into what it would become uh, today, which is in effect Europe's Supreme Court for human rights cases. And Boyle was a pioneer in trying to use it to redress injustice. He also co-authored a series of reports on policing the courts and protecting individual rights that played a role in the British government's decision to eventually phase out internment without trial to reform the legal system and modify the behavior of the security forces. Nonetheless, the violence continued, shootings and bombings staged by the IRA and by a variety of Protestant loyalist paramilitary groups. Meanwhile, the British Army was waging a kind of counterinsurgency campaign, largely targeting the IRA, but also occasionally targeting Protestant militants. As I well remember, daily life in Northern Ireland 
uh, back when I was uh, going there in the 70s and even in the 80s, became a grim challenge of negotiating bomb scares, roadblocks, and explosions with soldiers patrolling the streets and gunmen in both the Catholic and Protestant areas waiting to strike. One of the most contentious issues in those years was the status of IRA prisoners. They wanted to be treated as political prisoners. The British government, however, was determined to treat them as common criminals, denying them political status and insisting they wear standard prison uniforms, which they refused to do. In 1980 and 1981, IRA prisoners staged a series of hunger strikes, trying to force the British to back down. But British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, whose nickname was the Iron Lady, was unyielding. The standoff in which 10 men eventually starved themselves to death fueled the violence, and it led to a sharp rise in support for the IRA. It also prompted the first foray into electoral politics by the IRA's political wing, Sinn Féin, which sought to capitalize on the public support in Catholic areas for the hunger strikers who were revered as heroes. In the course of my research, I discovered that Boyle, who was strongly against the IRA's campaign of violence, was involved with the support of the then Irish Prime Minister, Garrett Fitzgerald, in a secret, although ultimately unsuccessful effort to use the machinery of the European Court of Human Rights to negotiate an end to the IRA hunger strikes. A few years later, Boyle was involved in another also largely secret but much more successful initiative. He was working with a longtime collaborator named Tom Haddon. Interestingly, Haddon was a Protestant whose family came from one of the most hardline Protestant communities in Northern Ireland. And this was part of a pattern of Boyle transcending Northern Ireland sectarian differences in many ways, not least by marrying Joan, who was also a Protestant. Um, Boyle and Haddon played an influential role in creating much of the, intell of, the, uh, of the intellectual underpinning for the priest process that took hold in Northern Ireland in the 1980s and would climax in what became known as the Good Friday peace deal in 1998, which effectively ended the Troubles. This is an interesting story. And I like to share a, a bit more detail about it. Um, in, 19, in the end of 1983, the Irish Prime Minister, Garrett Fitzgerald, established what was called the New Ireland Forum. The goal was to find a new direction for what was called constitutional nationalism in both halves of Ireland. That is people who aspired to an eventual united Ireland but rejected the use of force and wanted to undermine this political support for the IRA and for the IRA's political wing Sinn Féin. In the wake of the hunger strikes I was just talking about, that support um, had increased very substantially. So after months of meetings and receiving scores of submissions, um, the forum produced a report with three proposals to solve the problem. A united Ireland, a confederation of the North and the South, and an Ireland uh, and Northern Ireland where the Irish Republic and Great Britain would share joint authority. But Boyle and his colleague argued that the three proposals were totally unrealistic because there was no way the Protestants in the North would agree to any of them. Instead, they wrote a critique of the forum report that called for the Irish Republic to recognize the legitimacy of Northern Ireland as it presently existed. And they urged that any immediate action be directed towards a fuller recognition of the identity rights and interests of the nationalist minority in the North, rather than the unionist minority in Ireland as a whole. They then put forward what they called an alternative framework for action, which they argued should be underpinned by a binding international agreement between London and Dublin. They emphasized the need to give legal effect to the validity of both traditions in Northern Ireland of what concept they called parity of esteem. And they offered specific proposals on power sharing and minority participation in government and measures to protect basic rights, including the passage of a Bill of Rights. Um, when asked her view of the three models proposed by the New Ireland Forum, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher responded with her customary brusqueness. Unified Ireland. Uh, uh, was one solution that is out. Um, a second solution was 
a confederation of two states. That is out. A third solution was joint authority. That is out. That is a derogation from sovereignty. This, be this became known as Margaret Thatcher's out, out, out press conference. Uh, and many people thought it meant the end of, of, of a peace process that was just getting underway. But in the course of my research, I did, uncovered a classified document that proved that the paper that Kevin Boyle and his colleague uh, had drafted had actually been brought to Thatcher's attention by British Northern Ireland secretary. And after a summit meeting with the Irish prime minister, uh, he later told Kevin Boyle that at one point, Thatcher had taken a copy of this paper, plopped it on the table and said, on this, we can do business. Indeed, when uh, she and the Irish prime minister signed what became known as the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985, an event I remember well because I was in the room covering it for CNN, um, the central concept was an idea that Boyle and Tom Haddon had long sought to establish as the guiding principle of any solution. The formal recognition of the right of Northern Ireland's majority Protestant unionists to remain in the United Kingdom as long as they wished, while acknowledging the right of Northern Catholic nationalists to express their Irish identity. In the years leading up to the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, Boyle consistently stressed the importance of strong legal protections for human rights as the foundation for any peace deal. He urged over and over that a uh, Bill of Rights be adopted for Northern Ireland that would be based on the European Convention on Human Rights and called for such protections to be built into a, a, a new Anglo-Irish agreement. Meanwhile, even though the violence went on into the 1990s, it became clear the IRA was not going to be able to bomb Northern Ireland into a united Ireland. But as the space for legitimately pursuing nationalist aspirations within the North in a peaceful way widened, something Boyle had consistently urged the British government to accept, the IRA called off its campaign and Protestant loyalist paramilitary groups soon followed suit. In 1998, the Good Friday deal was signed, bringing the troubles to an end. Although hardly alone in his views, it's striking when you look back at how much of the substance of the peace deal and some of the key steps afterwards reflected positions that Boyle had articulated and lobbied for over many years. This included the principle of consent that Northern Ireland would remain in the UK as long as a majority of its citizens wanted it to do so, recognizing the legitimacy of both the Protestant Unionist tradition and the Catholic Nationalist tradition, drafting a Bill of Rights, the Irish Republic, which had a clause in its constitution laying claim to Northern Ireland, agreeing to give up that claim, and reforming the Northern Irish police. In fact, in 1999, Chris Patton, who I'd gotten to know here in Hong Kong when he'd been the last British colonial governor, was asked to come up with recommendations to reform what was then still known as the Royal Ulster Constabulary, a force viewed with deep suspicion and hostility by much of the nationalist community. Boyle and a colleague submitted a paper to Patton on the importance going forward of incorporating human rights into policing. Significantly, this was a position Patton adopted, writing in his report that, quote, the purpose of policing is to uphold human rights and respect human dignity. So it's fair to say that Boyle, though he shied away from the limelight and never sought credit, was, as Ireland's former president, Mary Robinson, told me when I interviewed me, her for the book, very influential in the thinking behind the peace deal. But Boyle's impact was felt well beyond Northern Ireland. He was the lead lawyer in the case of Jeffrey Dudgeon, uh, which decriminalized homosexuality in Northern Ireland, the case which then led to its legalization in the Irish Republic, in Cyprus, and in other countries, and was cited in 2005 by the US Supreme Court in the landmark gay rights case in the States. He conducted major missions for Amnesty International in South Africa during the darkest days of apartheid, the system of racial separation that allowed the white minority there to rule over the black majority and played an important role in the campaign that helped uh, pressure the government to end that system. At the end of 1986, he became uh, the founding director of Article 19, a new NGO that was intended to do for freedom of expression what Amnesty International was doing for prisoners of conscience. 
Today, Article 19 remains an important voice in the battle for freedom of expression. Article 19 is both an ideal and an organization. Uh, uh, the name comes from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 19th article of that declaration of 1948, uh, which proclaims everyone's right to freedom of opinion and freedom of expression, uh, the right to hold opinions without interference without fear and the right to seek, receive and impart ideas and information of all kind. That, that's the ideal and we took that name as our name of our organization and our mission is to promote a censorship free world, to promote that declaration which most governments, indeed all governments, have in one fashion or another approved of this universal declaration and our strategy as all other human rights groups is to try to get governments to live up to their commitments. In 1989, Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini issued a fatwa, a religious edict, calling for the murder of the Indian-born British writer Salman Rushdie. The reason was that Rushdie had written a novel called The Satanic Verses that Islamic extremists claimed was anti-Islam. Um, it was Boyle uh, uh, who became the public face of the campaign to defend Rushdie. Uh, Boyle conceived of and drafted a famous letter that was signed by thousands of writers, including several winners of the Nobel Prize for Literature, in support of Rushdie and the concept of freedom of expression. And this happened in a climate of unprecedented fear for writers and booksellers. Rushdie's Japanese translator was murdered, as was someone who worked on the book for the Italian edition. There were bombs in bookstores. So it was an act of great personal courage. During the 1980s and 90s, Boyle also fought and won numerous important cases before the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, France. Some were important in expanding uh, international legal protections for freedom of the press. This include the Gersold case, where Boyle defended a Danish TV reporter who'd done a broadcast about neo-Nazi skinhead gangs, only to be convicted by Danish courts of disseminating racism merely for airing what the skinheads had said when he interviewed them. In its ruling on this case, the court established a key principle that it wasn't for the court or any government to decide what material journalists should or should not include in their reports. There's another case, it's one of my favorites, the Norwegian seal hunter case. You'll have to read the book for the details, but it involved the Norwegian newspaper and its editor being convicted of defamation after publishing the contents of a government report that it was leaked on the grounds that the contents of the report were defamatory and the newspaper had not verified the accuracy of what was in the government document. In a victory for Boyle, the court established another key principle to defend the freedom of the press, which is the press was entitled to cover the content of official reports without having to first verify that everything in the report was true. Boyle's involvement with the European court climaxed in the 1990s when he worked on scores of cases at Strasbourg on behalf of the Kurdish minority in southeastern Turkey who had faced imprisonment, torture, rape, and murder at the hands of the Turkish security forces. In the case of intense intimidation from the Turkish government and military and security forces, Boyle and his colleagues fought and won most of these cases, um, which included uh, rulings that uh, allowed people to seek justice at an international tribunal like the European court um, if it was clear that the domestic laws and where they were would not give them such redress. Um, it was a, they, there was a landmark case in which uh, it was ruled, the European court ruled that somebody who came out of prison visibly mistreated that the government was responsible for that. If, they, if you were arrested and you came out and you'd clearly been beaten up or mistreated, mistreated the government was liable. And most important was a ruling that rape was a war crime. And that ruling played a significant role in the work of the international tribunals that were set up to address the genocide in Rwanda and war crimes carried out on the for in during the war in the former Yugoslavia. In the early 2000s, Boyle served as the chief advisor to former Irish President Mary Robinson during her time as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. This put him at the center of the intense debate about how to fight terrorism while protecting human rights following the Al-Qaeda terror attacks on September 11, 2001. Boyle and Robinson took the position that the attacks should be characterized as a crime against humanity. And as crimes, they argued that states should use the law to go after terrorists and their networks. 
this put them at odds with the position of the uh, US President George W. Bush uh, administration of an unending so-called war on terror. Boyle argued that this notion was a war on an abstraction and it increased the possibility of human rights abuses and had the potential to undermine the broad international support the US enjoyed in the immediate aftermath of the September 11th attacks. And that's exactly what happened. It was just one example of Boyle's uncanny ability to identify issues and trends earlier than many others, which is why so many of the people I interviewed for my book described him as a visionary. There are numerous examples. In the late 1980s, for instance, after the nuclear disaster at the nuclear power plant in Chernobyl in the Soviet Union, and with the growth of the HIV AIDS epidemic, he wrote about the crucial links between freedom of expression and public health. Freedom of information, he said, is not a luxury, but may literally be a matter of life and death. The validity of that observation has only been underscored by the questions that have been raised about the transparency or lack thereof of some governments around the world in response to the spread of COVID. In his final years, Boyle identified a series of worrying new challenges. In 2008, for example, he talked about how technology was threatening the right to privacy in a way that could jeopardize human rights. That same year, he also warned that the way huge companies were accumulating uh, information could also threaten personal freedom. This was years before concern over political manipulation of Facebook, Twitter, and social media became a burning international issue. Through all of this time, and I just want to end here by saying, Boyle also was a full-time college professor. He taught in Belfast and in Galway, and for the last 20 years of his life at the University of Essex. And at Galway and Essex, he helped to create human rights centers. He was a pioneer uh, in introducing the idea that human rights should become part, standard part of uh, teaching about law. And that's something that is, is widely accepted today. And the centers that he created are among the most important, particularly the one in Essex, for training human rights advocates. And in fact, if you look around the world at the key people in uh, organizations like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, many other uh, NGOs, Many of them are his former students. In fact, they're known as the Essex Mafia because he trained so many of them at the University of Essex. And that, I think, beyond all the specific things that I've laid out here, may be his most important legacy of training a generation of people to carry on the fight for human rights to which he devoted his life. So let me stop here. Um, I'm sorry I've gone on a bit, but we still have some time for questions and answers on uh, uh, any of these issues or anything else you'd like to talk about. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much. That was really interesting and you covered so much. I mean, um, I read the book and I really enjoyed it so much. Um, so right now is the time for Q&A. So um, people, if you want to, you can either put your questions in the chat and I'll read them out or you can, um, you can raise your hand and unmute. And while we're while we're um, we're waiting for questions, Mike, I'm going to break the ice and ask a question, if that's okay. And that is, when I was reading the book, I mean, when you were just you were just discussing him establishing the human rights centers and all these things, and how did he do so much? I mean, at one point, I was thinking, what did he eat, or how much did he ever yeah. sleep? Uh, but also in your book, you had spoken a lot about um, how he mentored people or that people, he would, would raise something to me and say, yeah, go for it. So I was wondering if maybe you could speak to that either about how he managed to do so much, I mean, or about his ability to delegate that must have been quite remarkable. Well, he was just a man of prodigious energy. Some people have it and some people don't. And he was, uh, he was somebody who, who was able to juggle more things than a normal human being could possibly do. And what was striking to me was these are not simple things that he was doing. He was uh, handling extremely complex legal cases. It's not like I was a journalist. I had to work really hard too, but I would write a two minute TV spot. It was a 400 word, 300 word script. He was writing a 30 page legal briefs and dealing with extraordinarily complex issues. So, you know, there are just some people who, who are like that. Um, I want to, it's very, very interesting to me, his relationship 
with his students. And uh, you know, I would say that you know, students ought, would be very lucky to get a professor like that because he was very, very engaged with his students. He was, he was uh, extreme, he was open to them intellectually. He was very encouraging. Um, students that exhibited a degree of interest and curiosity, he often brought them in to help him with his cases. For example, I mentioned these cases involving the, the Kurdish minority in southeastern Turkey. Um, he worked with another colleague from the University of Essex, who's a very, very distinguished lawyer. Um, but then they recruited a young woman who had just finished their law program. Uh, and and uh, she became one of their, uh, one of the lawyers in this case. And she's now the top lawyer at Human Rights Watch in New York. Wow. Um, so there, there, there are many, and, and the other part about, and Paul really loved his students. So it was a tradition every cr Christmas, the students would come from all over the world to study in England. And every Christmas, his wife would talk about, we would collect all the strays, the people who couldn't go back to South America or Africa, and we'd have them over for a big Christmas meal. Um, and and um, in the course of my research, you know, he had students from Hong Kong, he had students from Brazil, he had students from Turkey, uh, it's students from Colombia, and and the level of sort of devotion. It's quite it's quite a remarkable relationship that is not something that you always get with a professor. And I think that's in the end, you know, may have meant more to him than anything else. And it's a good example for 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 professors to follow, and it's it's for students to keep a lookout. If you find a professor like that, take advantage of it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, people, you can also um, unmute or, as I said, please put questions in the chat because we really would like to hear what you have. Um, let's see. Somebody has just put in a question. Um, um, Mike, do you still have a visa for Hong Kong or a visa to <laughs> Hong Kong? I, I live in Hong Kong. I, I, I first visited Hong Kong in 1973. Um, I, I, on, on my making my first trip into China. I lived here from 1975 to 1983. Uh, I spent eight years in Beijing. I was in London for several years when I was covering Northern Ireland again. And I was in Beijing for eight years. And I was here for 10 years as CNN Hong Kong bureau chief and senior Asia correspondent. And then I came back a number of years ago. So I'm, I'm, I live in Hong Kong. And that's why, that's why, that's why uh, what you mentioned at the beginning, if anybody was interested in getting a copy of the book, I'm here. So if you are interested, uh, it's 250 Hong Kong dollars. Drop me an email. I'm happy to meet up somewhere uh, and uh, and uh, and give you a copy. Yep, and he'll sign it too. And um, I put his email in the um, in 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 the um, in the chat as well, and I'll send it to you all later as well. Okay. Any other questions? Please don't be shy. Um, let's see. Um, okay, does, um, let's see. So one thing I'm also wondering about is, um, is whether or not, um, if you could speak a little bit more about how, um, he was doing, um, oh yes, the blasphemy. <laughs> um, one of the things I found really interesting was that it, you said that his first, um, one of the first things that he encountered as a student was um, as a, he, he had wanted to, to take part in a play that had to do with blasphemy and that that changed the blasphemy law. And, um, or did he challenge it? I'm sorry, maybe I, I'm misremembering. This is an interesting story. Um... You wouldn't think in modern day Britain that blasphemy would be, I mean, that was something that you sort of, you know, go back to the 1500s and 1600s and, you know, burning witches at the stake and so on. But uh, in the 1960s in the UK, there was a law that made it illegal to depict God on the stage. That was considered an insult to God. And Boyle, as a university student, was not particularly interested in directly in politics, although he was intellectually curious, he was passionate about the theater, uh, but not as an actor. He was a tech guy. He would, did the lighting and so on. Mm -hmm. And there was a theater troupe that was formed at the Queen's University of Belfast. And it's mostly kids of your age. 
and they they there was a they did a play, um, and the play was envisaged as a conversation between Jesus and God, and it was controversial to begin with because the the student actor that who played Jesus was a Nigerian exchange student, so they had a 1962 having a black actor play Jesus, was already testing the limits. But they they tried to perform this uh, at, in, in, at, a, at an arts festival in Edinburgh, Scotland, and the police wouldn't let them do it. And wow. Boyle's first public, because it violated blasphemy laws, because you right. couldn't show God on the stage. Uh, and Boyle's first publication of any kind was something in the Queen's University student newspaper about blasphemy uh, and, and, and uh, how bad it was to have these restrictive blasphemy laws. And so fast forward several decades and you have this controversy about Sal the writer Salman Rushdie in 1989. And for those of you listening who may not have heard of it, this is a very, very interesting episode. Um, as I said, the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, the spiritual leader of Iran, without having read the book, like many of the critics of the book, decided be based on hearsay that it was it made critical comments about Islam and therefore the writer uh, had, uh, you know this was blasphemous and the writer should be sentenced to death and Iran of course you know they had act connections with terrorist organizations it was no idle threat back then and and this really became one of the first moments in this clash which continues to this day between the forces of sort of Islamic radicalism and Western liberalism. You know, how do you balance this out? Uh, there have been many, many others since, and, and, and there have been many episodes of violence since. But the, the condemning of a British writer to death for what he wrote um, in, this, in this way was really the first such episode. And Boyle was at the center of it, and he came out um, uh, very strongly in favor of uh, freedom of expression. But in this letter that I mentioned, he drafted a letter, they got thousands, I think in the end they got 10,000 writers to sign it, uh, and including several people who either had won or would win the Nobel Prize for Literature. But the letter is very interesting because even while they defend Rushdie, they also call for a dialogue. They say, we recognize people have different views, but you know we should talk about it. And that I think was something that distinguished Boyle was, um, he wasn't interested in condemning uh, you know, people with whom he disagreed. He wanted to in, engage with them. Um, and so, for, for example, in 2008, he went to China and he gave a series of lectures at universities in China on the UN's human rights structures and mechanisms and so on. And he, he was very well received because he didn't go there to preach. This is the way and you have to follow it. He was a listener and he was an engager and so on. And one of the results is that um, even though he was a guy who was um, involved in a great many controversial and sensitive issues, I had great difficulty in the course of research and I interviewed well over a hundred people finding people who, who disliked him personally, even people who were on the, even people who were on the other side in some of these very controversial cases ended up liking him in some cases becoming very close friends with him. Mm. So he was able to very distinguish remarkable. differences of views on serious issues from condemning somebody personally. And I think that's a very important quality, and especially in this day and age, where in so many places around the world, there's so much polarization, to be able to honestly disagree, but have enough respect for the person that you can have a dialogue is, I think, a very important thing that we don't have enough of now. Okay, well, great. Thank you. So um, we're going to be getting ready to um, just take sort of a group photo <laughs> so that we'll be able to remember ourselves. And um, please, we still have a, couple, a minute or two more if anyone has further questions. Um, so yeah, please turn on your camera so we can see all your happy faces. And um, so yay. <laughs> I know some of you might have been shy earlier. Okay, great. So yeah. Please. I, if I could just say that those of you, I know it's a little daunting to speak up with all these strangers on a screen, um, but if anyone, if 
in the course of, if you're interested in getting a copy of the book and want to have a cup of tea and a chat, uh, just one-on-one, -on -one, just drop me a note. Uh, needless to say, with COVID, I'm not going anywhere. And I'm always very happy to talk with students. So feel free and don't feel shy. Okay, great. Oh, there is one other question. Somebody um, has asked, um, could you share on one of the two most challenging things that you, in preparing the book, in writing the book? I mean, you mentioned 100, 100 interviews. So was that the most challenging or what was the, you know, the well, most challenging? This was the fourth, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, this is the fourth book I've written. In addition to two that you mentioned earlier, I wrote a short ebook also about North Korea called The Last POW, about an, Amer an elderly American who was detained under mysterious circumstances in North Korea a number of years ago. Um, but this is the first biography, and it's different. My other books are sort of political diplomatic history, but biography involves not just what did somebody do, but trying to get inside their head and their heart you know, mm, what, yeah. what was their personal journey like? How did, you know, when these things that they were involved in happened, you know, how did they feel? Uh, and, 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 and you have a great responsibility because um, I don't think there are going to be too many more biographies of Kevin Boyle. So you're in effect creating the historical record. Um, and so, so that was very, very challenging. But I, I was very lucky because his his family were very supportive. I I, I may I I I said to them at the beginning that that um, you know I asked for their blessing. I made clear that I was going to approach it uh, as a journalist and a historian. Uh, I didn't show them anything that I wrote before it came out, um, but they were they were very willing to help. Uh, his wife in particular, and so I I was given access to, um, first of all, Kevin Boyle was one of these people, a bit like me, he never threw anything out. If you saw my office, you would understand. Um, and so even though he was, he was an interesting comment, he was a very modest, self-effacing guy. He wasn't interested in talking about, I did this, I did that, I did this. He was interested in talking about the, about the issues, but he wasn't interested in sort of showing off all the great things he did, but he also never threw anything out. And so, this archive that of his papers, what prompted me to think I could do a book was uh, the university uh, archivist organized the material and the list of what's in the archive is a PDF document that is 500 pages long. Just, just, the, list, just the list. Just the list of what's wow. there. Okay. So that that is made me, amazing. So there, uh, there were, you know, letters, emails, uh, journals, minutes of, you know, the executive committee meetings of the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association, correspondence on legal cases, transcript of transcripts of court hearings. Um, I think in the end, I have eight or 9,000 documents on a hard drive that I copied over months and months spent camped out in the library there. Um, and then I was able to go to family and friends, partly because he was liked by so many people. Nobody, unlike some situations I've been in, everybody was willing to talk. And you know, the Irish, they love to talk. So um, <laughs> everybody was very welcoming. So I was able to sort of say, well, I see that at, you know, at this particular moment, he said or wrote or did this. What do you remember about that? And somebody would tell me, yes, he was worried, he was excited, he was sad, he was happy. So, uh, and, and I was able to get, particularly from his family, some material that wasn't in the archive. Um, mm. But that was really, you know, creating, you know, somebody's inner life as opposed to external life um, was a, a great challenge, but also immensely interesting to do and, and, in the end, when you know, I seem to have pulled it off. Very, very satisfying to get you know to sort of really get inside somebody's head and 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 heart. And I was very lucky. For example, when he was dying of lung cancer, he had a correspondence with one of his former students about the early days of the troubles, the period that I devoted a lot of time to at the beginning of this talk, wondering whether or not, even though he was against violence and he was definitely not sectarian in any way, whether he had some lingering responsibility without ever having intended it mm. for the way things went badly 
because of what he did. And there's this fascinating email correspondence about a month before he died with a former student where he shares this stuff. And I was able to dig all these things up and I, I was deeply moved myself, yeah. um, but it was fascinating in trying to put, put all this together. So that was both the biggest challenge and I think the most satisfying part when I, I feel I largely met the challenge. Okay, that's great. All right, well, thank you very much. Now, um, so it's about time for us to end. So thank you for those who asked questions. And um, I will also, um, right now, I want to share a, um, we're, we have a short feedback survey. Um, so if you want to use this QR code right now to um, start filling that in, please go ahead. Um, and um, it will help us as part of, um, <clears throat> of um, knowing how, how you appreciate it and how you understood this. Um, those in Health 1010, please fill it out. It's important. I'll also be emailing you um, the next day with a link as well. OK, so um, let's see. In the chat, we have, um, oh, somebody asked me to share the link. Let me copy and paste the link as well. Okay, I've also just copied and pasted the link into the share. Um, so everybody, what I'd, I'm going to stop the share for a second while I want us all to say thank you very much, Mike, for this really, really interesting and inspiring talk. Everybody, please join me in saying thank you, thank you, thank you. That was really a wonderful talk. And um, you're all free to go, and I will now um, stop the recording.